Servicemen, on account of their operations, are notoriously guarded as one slip of the tongue can mean the difference between life and death, not just for them and their brothers in arms, but for the country. But in a first-of-its-kind interview with our Olive Burrows, the Chief of the Defence Forces, General Robert Kibochi, reflects on 10 years in Somalia, the Kenya Defence Forces' foray into the governance space and the unexpected threat of the COVID-19 pandemic. He also opens up about his personal journey to General and the weight he bears on his shoulders. We are joined by the Chief of the Defence Forces on account of COVID protocols. Uh, please allow me to keep my mask on. And the CDF, if you're not familiar, is General Robert Kibochi. So you've been in the military for 41 years, if I'm not mistaken. How does it feel to be the CDF? To become the CDF is, is a big thing, it's a huge thing. Uh, because uh, as you know, uh, when we joined, uh, or rather when we joined, uh, we joined very early. Uh, very young at 20, uh, 20 year olds. Uh, and you see this pyramid uh, that uh, starts from a second lieutenant uh, all the way to a four star general is a long way. Mm. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is a feeling of fulfillment uh, from an individual perspective. And it's also uh, a huge responsibility. Uh, remember, you are taking the security of the entire nation uh, with yourself. Uh, the military, as you know, is the uh, instrument of power that uh, you would want to employ as a last resort. Uh, that means uh, if we were going to go into uh, a war, uh, you take the whole country with yourself. Is it something you aspired to when you were growing up? Where did you grow up? I grew up uh, in the villages uh, in uh, Nakuru. And uh, I happened to have attended uh, a school uh, in Gilgil. Uh, the school is located right inside a military cantonment. Uh, and obviously, uh, that uh, environment, uh, you know, informed my uh, joining the force. Now, did I know that, uh, uh, or rather, did I aspire to become a CDF? I don't think so. Uh, it, it is very difficult to aspire because um, I remember you are many of you uh, and it's a highly competitive environment. But I believe uh, that uh, it is a question of uh, uh, a combination of many factors, uh, some luck and some hard working, uh, you know, that probably uh, works around here. Okay. Yeah. Allow me to ask, is your mother still? Yes, I, my mama is around, my father is around. What, what was their reaction uh, when, when you were I, appointed CDF? It was, it was huge. I mean, they couldn't believe it. Uh, uh, they couldn't believe. And I think it is a question of not believing it, not just the CDF, because you climb, you become a colonel, you become a brigadier, you become a major general, you become a lieutenant general. Uh, as you know, I became the army commander. Uh, so again, that was a huge one. Uh, and then uh, obviously becoming CDF was a major issue. Uh, so managing uh, those uh, emotions uh, of my old folks uh, was quite something, mm. right? And how you received at home? Do you know? Do people see you, you know, driving, uh, going no. home, and they salute uh, you? No, or? they don't. Obviously, <laughs> uh, these are civilians. They don't care <laughs> whether you're forced or not. Uh -huh. Yeah, or they know that you're uh, you're the head of the military. Uh, and uh, as you know, uh, I think there is a lot of admiration of the military, uh, particularly in the villages. Mm. Uh, so there is that uh, uh, respect that you, you, you receive uh, when uh, uh, you're in the villages. Do you sleep at night? Yes, I do. Uh, I, do speak, I do sleep. Uh, we sleep uh, short hours, but yes, we do. Uh, we have to sleep because if you don't, obviously, uh, you cannot perform. All right. Yeah. So what does a typical day look like for you? My typical day, uh, especially uh, now, uh, because we've had quite a number of activities going on, uh, we start off here at about six, six in the morning. Uh, uh, I happen to be probably one of the early uh, arrivals here in the morning. Uh, so everybody now has had to uh, you know, adopt my way of uh, coming early. Uh, and uh, we are here because uh, that early to get to understand uh, the situational awareness, uh, the environment, particularly uh, having about 10,000 soldiers uh, in 
active operations, mm. uh, about 5,000 in Somalia. Uh, the rest uh, spread from Mandera all the way Boni Forest uh, to Kyunga uh, is, a huge, uh, is a huge force. Uh, we have others in Mount Elgon, uh, in Moyale. You know, so you get to understand uh, the situation. Where, how are they? Uh, because uh, really, uh, it is critical that I know what, they, what is going on. Mm. And it is uh, important uh, that uh, by 7, uh, 7 I uh, have to be able to brief up uh, the Commander-in-Chief, and who is the President, uh, also what is going on uh, across, across the country. Okay. We also work very closely with the, uh, the National Police Service uh, and the National Intelligence Service, uh, and therefore we share uh, uh, the situation so that we get a, we get a common picture uh, of what is happening. Uh, so that helps uh, for us to be able to uh, be on the same page. Okay. Right. So you took up office at a point at which the globe, not just the country, was in the grips of the COVID right. pandemic. Yes. How has that affected your operations? It has been uh, uh, a major change, uh, particularly uh, because we uh, not, are not used to operating with masks uh, the way we are doing now. Uh, but we've had to uh, obviously adapt to that. Uh, and adapting uh, for us, I think, has been easy uh, because, as you know, Ours is a very hierarchical system uh, that operates from uh, obedience of, of instructions and orders. Uh, so here, everybody has been able to uh, ensure that uh, the protocols that are defined are well uh, adhered to. The areas that we've had a bit of a, a challenge is in terms of recruitment and training. Uh, because um, we recently had a recruitment of about 4,000 uh, 4,300, uh, you know, uh, recruits and about 300 cadets. Uh, it was a challenge uh, because uh, you had to, we had to spread uh, the, the the recruitment period for over a long time because you have to test everybody. Mm. Uh, you know, retest them if they are positive, allow them to stay for 10 days. So that took us close to a whole month uh, to complete the process. The other challenge is uh, how do you train up 4,300 uh, personnel uh, inside uh, a cantonment uh, that has other people who also stay outside. So we had to change the entire dynamics, uh, ensure that those who train them also uh, become confined uh, in the training institution. So you create a bubble uh, where nobody leaves. And if they do leave, uh, they will go and come back, uh, tested, you know, quarantined. Uh, and it, it, it has worked. It has mm -hmm. worked well. Uh, you get a few, uh, you know, uh, positives, but it has worked well. Have you suffered any fatalities? We COVID? have. We have suffered a few uh, fatalities, uh, not many. Uh, I would say uh, below 1%. Uh, we are very fortunate that we have a very uh, robust uh, medical a system. Uh, as you know, uh, our medical system spreads across the entire force. So we established uh, a facility at Kabete, uh, uh, the Kabete uh, camp uh, here on Wayakiwe, mm. and one at Langata. Uh, so we were able to create a uh, very robust medical care system, including uh, ICU facilities. So we've been able to save a lot of our people uh, along the way. Okay. Yes. All right. You 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 brought up the issue of uh, recruitment and the challenge that COVID nineteen right. posed yes. in that exercise. Right. Um, another challenge that usually comes up around mm -hmm. recruitment yes. is concerns around corruption. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. People either posing as yeah. military officers, yes. Yes. telling people, "Send us this amount of money, yeah. we'll secure you a place." Absolutely. How are you dealing with that, or how have you dealt with that? We realize that um, this problem with, within the military. Uh, does exist. Uh, a few rotten apples have had uh, to be uh, caught up. Right now, I'm dealing with about 13 cases. We realize we need to be more uh, tough with, uh, with, with, with this behavior. So we have uh, introduced that uh, anybody who is found to uh, have been involved in malpractices of recruitment uh, go through a court martial uh, process. So we have uh, taken this 13 uh, through a court martial process. What, what, does, what does that mean? It means that uh, you go through that process and you go to jail. In addition to being fired and dismissed, 
you also pass through the jail. Okay. Yeah. I wonder what was the recruitment process for like for you when you were being recruited? Days. Yes. During our days, in fact, it was very easy. You know, many people never wanted to join the forces uh, during those days. Uh, for us, uh, as I said, who are uh, socialized within a military environment, uh, were very, uh, you know, attracted uh, to the uniform, to uh, the, the way the military looked, and therefore we joined. But to a large extent, not very many people wanted to join. Uh, many people would have gone, wanted to go to the university. I actually uh, had to uh, run away from Form 5 in Nyeri High School uh, to join the military. My parents didn't know that I was joining. So were you required, I don't know, did they test your speed? Were you required to run around? I hear they count your teeth. Yes, they do. Does that still happen? It does happen, uh, and this is important. Uh, it is important to the extent that uh, the moment you join uh, the Defense Forces, you have to be able to be fit uh, as a holistic uh, to the extent that uh, when you leave you also go through uh, a medical uh, board uh, and so that uh, if there's anything that has happened to you during your tenure here uh, whether you be 40 years or not they will compensate you so if you get uh, we get you with a uh, few teeth uh, it is going to be very difficult for us to to compensate you just curious how is today's recruit mm -hmm. different from the recruit of your generation? Now, we are getting children, uh, that uh, our children, uh, who have to be taken to school by vehicle all the, uh, all, all the time, and therefore they have not developed the stamina that we, we need. So we are getting children who uh, we have to be very careful on how to handle them. Uh, for example, if you uh, start training uh, and you ask them to run for uh, 10 kilometers, you will lose them. Uh, you will lose them because they have not been conditioned that way. So we are having to change the curriculum in a way that you adapt uh, to the generation that you are, you are leading. Uh, we are getting a lot of uh, cases today of uh, recruits or cadets having broken uh, their, uh, their, their, their limbs in, when, when they are running. Uh, you know, now that means that uh, you have to be very careful on how you, you handle them. Yes. In October of 2021, that 20. is in July, August, September, yeah. in four months. Two, four months, eh? It'll be 10 years Yes. since we got into Somalia. Right. How much of an impact have we made? Uh, as we speak today, uh, we have close to almost 14 areas that we, uh, we, 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 we are operating from. And in those areas, uh, we have had to... One, secure the population uh, from Al-Shabaab. Secondly, there is a whole question of uh, development and mentoring of the security, local security forces, uh, the Somali National Security Forces, and because it's part of the mandate of our mission. Uh, so we've had an opportunity to train up them, uh, to uh, at times even equip them uh, using our own resources. We've been able to... Uh, work with them uh, in operations. And it's important uh, to the extent that uh, we cannot be in Somalia forever. Uh, the Americans have just uh, been left, they're leaving Afghanistan after 20 years. Uh, they've trained up so many uh, Afghan soldiers so that they can take over uh, to fight uh, the, the Taliban. Now the same thing uh, for us here is to see ourselves uh, as a force uh, together with other countries to develop these Somali National Security Forces, to be able to protect themselves. Uh, because I think that's the only solution that uh, uh, will be long-lasting. But have we been able to degrade uh, Al-Shabaab completely? Absolutely not. There's still some work to be done. So are we or are we not on course for a withdrawal in December? Withdrawal in December is not uh, withdrawal uh, as we know it. Uh, what is going to happen is that uh, the AMISOM, as you know, has been funded uh, primarily uh, through a bilateral arrangement between the African Union and the European Union. Uh, and, and this is coming to an end. Uh, the European Union is, uh, is stopping this particular uh, support. Uh, and therefore, the UN Security Council has called for a reconfiguration of AMISOM. Reconfiguration to the extent that uh, we are getting to a situation where uh, the military force will need to be supported uh, by other dimensions. And uh, what the UN has done is to commission 
uh, an independent assessment mission to look at what does this force uh, require, how will it look like. The African Union has done the same. Uh, we have participated in uh, providing our input into this. And we are looking forward uh, between now and I think October, the UN, United Nations Security Council will be sitting to determine what future uh, force will be configured for our mission. Uh, we, uh, as a country, are proposing that we have a multi-dimensional force. Uh, AMISOM has been purely, uh, largely, uh, military force. You cannot uh, win uh, a symmetric threat, a warfare like this one uh, through military force alone. You need people to come and build schools. You need people to come and build uh, hospitals. You need people to build roads. So Now, this requires uh, civilian dimension. We also need to see uh, the policing uh, becoming a part of uh, the, uh, the, the future force. Because today, what happens is that uh, if we have a place that we have taken over, for example, we are in a place called Doble. It's a bustling place, which was a very small village. Uh, it, it, it is us who do policing uh, and security. You need to get the civilian police to come and do this job. Uh, and so that uh, they can now start uh, also implementing uh, dimensions of law and order. So this is what we are calling for. Secondly, you will know that uh, the African mission in Somalia has been underfunded, hugely underfunded. Uh, underfunded. You can't compare it with a mission in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Congo or in uh, South Sudan. Uh, and for that reason, we've been uh, very much uh, uh, proposing that this future mission should be one uh, that is funded by the United Nations uh, Security Council. Because this is a UN mission, uh, just like any other. Uh, and, and, and this is what the African Union is also proposing. That the future force becomes uh, a United Nations m mandated force uh, and also funded. Uh, there's no point of mandating a force and you're not uh, providing resources for it. Mm. Uh, so it becomes a challenge. Okay, so you say severely underfunded. Yeah, severely underfunded. Has yes. that compromised then the security of our officers? Absolutely. Uh, it's severely underfunded, meaning that uh, there, there, are two, there, there are two issues that happen. One, you are not able to cover the entire uh, area uh, that you want to cover because then you become very much overstretched. Uh, it is underfunded and also the U uh, European Union, because has not been paying, has been asking the countries to down downsize their forces. Now for us, uh, because we have a huge interest, because we have border, uh, borders with Somalia, we've had to also create uh, our own troops, uh, you know, uh, that are paid by the Kenya government, you know, to supplement what ordinarily would have actually been paid for by the United Nations that is responsible for international peace and security. Uh, so the stretch has been huge, uh, and it is not sustainable. Uh, they have to be able to look at it uh, afresh, uh, and so that uh, there is more resources, uh, both in terms of human resources and also uh, equipment. Yes. Are they adequately equipped? They are not. Now, the only helicopters that are currently in Somalia are those that belong to Kenya and those that belong to Uganda. Now, you cannot be able to cover uh, a country that huge, with no uh, road infrastructure, without helicopters. You require helicopters seriously. Uh, and, and, and those are the kind of resources we are talking about. Uh, to date, the United Nations uh, has not uh, categorized uh, Al-Shabaab as a terror organization. Now, the moment you don't do that, then you are leaving gaps. Uh, you know we now have a seat uh, at the UN Security Council, and we are using that particular uh, representation to uh, get them to pass the message that Ashabab should be declared as a terror organization so that there are more resources uh, that come in to be able to fight. There's a concern that was raised last month right. that an aerial strike was carried out uh, right. by KDF mm -hmm. and that it targeted civilians mm -hmm. in Somalia. Right. What's your response to that? This is where the challenge is. You have so many actors uh, in Somalia uh, who have the capacity to undertake uh, the, the, the strikes they were talking about. 
therefore, uh, for us as a country, uh, see it as allegation that is linked to, uh, if you recall, uh, the uh, Somali National Army uh, came right close to Mandera, where they still are, uh, mm. in total violation uh, of international norms. Uh, and therefore, uh, the whole thing of linking Kenya uh, with Gedo, linking Kenya with elections in Somalia, all these uh, machinations uh, that are directed at, uh, you know, uh, placing Kenya as a as an aggressor, mm. uh, which is not correct. When Kenya first went into Somalia, there were all these accusations that, mm. oh, the military is selling charcoal, yes. they're exporting sugar. Mm -hmm. you, how are you able to address that? The allegations uh, about charcoal have existed for a long time. But no one can tell you that they have evidence that Kenyan troops uh, sell charcoal. Uh, the reason that uh, charcoal uh, becomes an issue is that Chaco uh, to the Somali people uh, is a source of income. Uh, Chaco to the Al Shabaab is a, is a source of income. So there is a competition between the local people, the uh, the militias themselves, uh, and the fall guy uh, always becomes the Kenyan uh, the Kenyan troops. Kenya has paid a heavy price, right. uh, and when I say that, I think of 2016, exactly. the El Ade attack. Right. Officially, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. no figures have ever been released mm -hmm. uh, by the Kenya Defense Forces. Mm -hmm. um, but there have been reports that mm -hmm. we have prisoners of war mm -hmm. being held by the Al Shabaab. Right. Are these credible reports? Figures uh, in the military are highly guarded. Uh, I think it's important to highlight that. Uh, figures of personnel killed in action, figures of equipment uh, captured or destroyed, uh, because that information in itself is a double-edged uh, information. It can be used uh, by uh, the adversary uh, very effectively. Uh, and therefore, uh, it is not that uh, the Kenya Defense Forces does not want to provide the information. It is that that information uh, will be used against our, our soldiers. Now that we are, we are still in Somalia. Now, the issue of uh, prisoners of war is also not accurate uh, to the extent that missing in action uh, is the classification uh, that is acceptable in environment of warfare. As many, mi missing in action could be as a result of death, could be a result of somebody has been injured uh, or somebody has deserted. And, and therefore, uh, we have not been able to uh, say for certain that we have prisoners of war. But are we doing something about it for missing in action? Absolutely. Uh, because those soldiers, for example, who uh, were either shot and ended up dying, uh, you know, in the, in the forest, it is our responsibility to be able to uh, get their remains. Uh, so those actions continue to be undertaken uh, by, uh, by ourselves. Uh, but the ones that are projected in social media are, 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 are areas that we cannot be able to uh, verify uh, that they are actually uh, prisoners of war or they are captives. All right. So um, Kenya is viewed as a strategic partner when it comes to stability in the region. Right. We have the situation in the DRC where we've yes. sent troops. We have, is it Mozambique, I believe? Mozambique, yes. Mozambique, where Rwanda mm -hmm. has sent mm -hmm. assistance. Yes. Uh, we have the Tigray situation right. in Ethiopia. There yes. has been some instability in South Sudan Absolutely. and in Sudan. Absolutely. Are you concerned particularly mm -hmm. with the Ethiopia situation over spillover? The fear is the uh, spread of this particular uh, conflict uh, to the southern part of the country because that would mean uh, that a lot of uh, refugees obviously would flow into our country uh, a lot of weapons uh, will also flow uh, into the country and that therefore that is a great uh, area of, of, of concern we have um, uh, been raising this issue, uh, particularly with the United Nations, so that there is some kind of intervention 
whether that intervention is diplomatic, uh, there has to be some kind of intervention because uh, Ethiopia with 100 million plus uh, population uh, is hugely uh, strategic. Let me bring you home now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had a military man appointed as Director General of the Nairobi Metropolitan Services. Right. Uh, KDF yes. is now in charge of the Kenya Meat Commission. Yes. <laughs> Where do we draw the line between yes. the primary, primary, I beg your pardon, right. primary responsibilities yes. mm -hmm. of the Kenya Defense Forces right. and civilian roles? Right. Civilian. The Constitution, 2010, the Constitution, has provided the mandate of the KDF. And uh, under Article 241, it says there are three parts. The first part of it is that KDF is responsible for the defense and protection or the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Kenya. That is sacroscant, it is the way it is. It says also in Part B of that uh, uh, article that KDF shall assist and cooperate with other authorities in areas uh, of uh, their competence, uh, whether there is an emergency or disasters. Take, for example, when the MV Uhuru uh, one uh, that was built in 1950 uh, was repaired by the Navy engineers. It took them 50 million shillings to repair that uh, ship that today takes about 2 million liters of fuel across uh, into Uganda uh, from the Kenyan side. The contractors that were supposed to do it privately were going to charge 1.5 billion shillings. When we go to KMC uh, and we were given this task uh, by the Commander-in-Chief to complete within six months, and we came with a budget of 670, 680 million shillings. And we did it in four months. And today, as we speak, the KMC is supplying all the security agencies with meat and meat products across the entire country. It is also benefiting the farmers, the farmers who bring their, uh, their cattle. And within 72 hours, the farmers are paid off. Isn't it something that the KDF should be congratulated uh, on uh, instead of being vilified? <laughs> I think we are... We are, we are, we are you we are, you we think are, you're being vilified? We're being vilified that we're becoming um, interventionist uh, into uh, other areas. But I think we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are contributing to national development. Part of the reason we needed the military to come into some of these institutions right. is to bring in sobriety yes. and also because corruption right. had infiltrated them. Exactly. So I think the concern is, it will, will there be cross-contamination, as it were? Because, uh, and also the issue of, in, you know, I don't know, what, it's not just in Kenya, but mm. giving up power, power is sweet. Yeah. So giving up power is also not quite so easy. Right. So I think there's that concern of cross-contamination. Are you not concerned mm. about that? The intention is to, to rework the processes, rework the procedures, uh, reinvigorate the, uh, the culture. Uh, and, and then you have a system that works, uh, really. Uh, is it possible that uh, in future probably, uh, when this culture uh, ingrains itself, uh, those that were managing it, uh, civilian staffers will continue? I'm sure they will. Uh, so when we assist the NMS, uh, it is not that we're just waking up one morning. No, we have to consult the, the lawyer here is a very tough lady. Uh, she makes sure that I live within the law. I can see a very tough uh, lady. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to go to the court martial you yeah. know, myself. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. very tough lady. Mm -hmm. Well, Anna, thank you very much mm -hmm. for speaking to us. Right. And just on that final question, when your mm -hmm. term comes to an end, mm -hmm. what is it that you would wish to be your legacy? We joined and trained uh, to fight against another country, which is called conventional war. But the threats have mutated. Uh, COVID is one of them. Uh, the, th the threat of terror is another one. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves, uh, and in fact, I saw other questions fighting locusts, mm -hmm. is that are we prepared uh, to fight and deal with these threats? We're also looking at uh, uh, addressing the question of housing. Uh, we are expanding, and houses are becoming a, a major challenge. 
Uh, we recently have gone into a PPP, uh, private pub public partnership uh, program, and we, s we want to start rolling out about 3,000 houses, uh, you know, in the next uh, few months, uh, in places in Nairobi here, in Mombasa, in Nanyuki, in a Loret, in Akuru. Uh, because we are getting more, more soldiers, young soldiers, uh, who require accommodation. So we're trying to rule out that, uh, which I think is, uh, is critical uh, for, for, for us. All right. Yeah. Thank you so very much for a very candid conversation. Thank you very I much. I have indeed. to say. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. <laughs>